This is the lecture for Ancient and Medieval History for Friday, the 17th of September, 2021. The great scholar of the Holocaust, Raoul Hilberg, once said that anti-Semitism can be summarized in three simple statements. Thou shalt not live as one of us. Thou shalt not live among us. Thou shalt not live. From the time of the expulsion of the Jews from Judea by the Emperor Hadrian in the year Anno Domini 134, Jews scattered around the known world. These Jews joined others who had left Judea voluntarily to live in Alexandria, Egypt, Rome, and countless other cities within the Roman Empire and beyond the Roman Empire, into the empires of the East, Parthia, then the New Persian Empire, some even all the way to India. As strangers in a strange land, Jews had a particularly difficult job because what they had to do is balance their own identity with assimilating into the culture that hosted them. Now, we have a story in American history that has a similar problem. In the early 1600s, England was ruled as an Anglican kingdom, no longer Roman Catholic Christian, the Church of England had become the official religion of the land. But the Church of England still retained <clears throat> many Catholic forms and many Catholic rituals. The main change was the replacement of the Pope with the King or Queen of England as the defender of the faith and the head of the Church. In England, as in many other European countries at the time, today, there was a faction of Reformed Christians, or Calvinists, or Puritans, who believed that the Church had taken on way too many medieval rituals and ideas, and needed to return to its, quote, pure, unquote, roots in Holy Scripture. These Puritans were as much a target, or almost as much, of a target of the government's repression against religious minorities as were the Roman Catholics that remained in England. Now, some of these people decided that the only way they would be able to preserve their religion was to leave England, the land of their birth, the origin of their language, and go to a nation uh, that was friendly to their religious beliefs. These Puritans left England for Holland because the Dutch Republic of the Netherlands was also Reformed Christian. In fact, the government had as its default the Reformed branch of Christianity known as Calvinism, or what is today called the Dutch Reformed Church. So these Puritans moved to Holland, but after a while they began to notice that not only did their, ch their children wear wooden shoes, but they came home speaking Dutch. In fact, they spoke Dutch so much that their English began to suffer. Now, the Puritans who went to Holland didn't go to give up their English identity. They left to preserve their religious identity. And it was clear that they would be absorbed into the Dutch society within a generation or two, at most. What to do? Well, at that time, there was a vast wilderness with no civilized men. It would be a risk. 
But these pilgrims, these Puritan pilgrims, decided to upstate again and leave Holland and go on the Speedwell, a ship to Virginia Colony in British North America. But there were problems, and the Speedwell had to return. So they then took ship on the Mayflower. The Mayflower went off course, and instead of landing in Virginia, they landed at Plymouth Rock in eastern Massachusetts, what would become known as eastern Massachusetts. Now, at first, the pilgrims, following the example of the early Christians, held all land in common. They basically practiced a form of Christian communism economically. The community decided who would farm what land, the community decided what they would plant, how they would grow it, how they would maintain it. Everything was held in common. Now, this was a problem. Actually, there were two problems. Number one, New England winters are much, much, much more uh, harsh than the winters even here, and certainly harsher than the winters in England, in old, very old England. George, where are you? Lady? Right there. Where? Ah. These masks are making it impossible easily remember people's names. Sorry, but it's the truth. They didn't know how to survive. They didn't know what local plants were good to eat. They didn't know how to harvest local seafood. They didn't know how to hunt. They didn't know what their relations would be with the native Indians. They didn't know how to survive. This aspect is overemphasized in the traditional story of Thanksgiving, where the native tribes took pity on these buffoons and showed them how to gather food in a New England, bless you, winter, in order to stay alive. Population had lost, the colony had lost almost a third of its population, and more were on their way out. Well, that is part of the story of the first Thanksgiving. But the other part is that the pilgrims abandoned this common ownership stuff. And instead, everyone had a claim of land that was theirs. They had the right to farm it as they choose, and they had the right to profit from extra food that they grew by selling it. Suddenly the land became more profitable, more productive. That's definitely a P word. The land became more productive, and that is also a part, an underrated part of the Thanksgiving story. Holding land in common, not always a good idea. They went to a wilderness that no European had settled to establish God's new Israel, a righteous society built on English culture and reformed Christian principles. And that is how they made their, maintained their identity. And the Pilgrim Fathers are an important component of what comes to make the American spirit the American Dream, and the American Republic. Any thoughts or comments on that before I refer to how this deals with the Jews? Throughout the history of the Diaspora, the Great Diaspora, the 1814 or so year history, from 134 to 1948, throughout this period, Jews did not necessarily have the option to go to a wilderness populated by people that they deemed savage. They had to live in civilized lands, in lands that were occupied by Germans, French, Dutch, 
Italians, Spaniards, English, Poles, Ukrainians, Russians, ultimately. By Romans and by Byzantine Greeks, Eastern Romans, they call themselves. And that means that the Jews had to find a way to live as productive members of these host societies. In doing so, they have to learn the language. They have to learn the customs. Do you burp after a meal like you do in the Arab Middle East? Or is burping considered rude? Is the expulsion of any bodily gas something that you do not do publicly? Unless you're amongst guys. What utensils do you use when you eat? Your fingers, a knife? Later they invent, at the end of the Middle Ages, this fork thing. Weird. Perfectly good fingers. you got to use a prong thing to carry food to your mouth. What's up with that? Use a spoon. Do you drink soup by pulling the bowl up and slurping it out of the bowl, or do you have to carry it to your mouth with a spoon? When you go to work, are you dressed cleanly? Are you formal? Or is it sort of do your own thing, man? How do you live? And Jews have to adapt. So the Jews who go to Italy learn the Italian folkways, and in Spain they learn the Spanish folkways, and so on. And there are some Jews, like the old Sadducees, Sadducees in Roman times, who basically see their Judaism as part of their identity. But they primarily see themselves as Germans or as Dutch or as Frenchmen or whatever, who happen to be Jewish. Now that's something easy for Americans to understand. We Americans are, have a national identity, but we have a wide variety of religious identities. To us, it's second nature to say, wow, I'm a Reformed Christian, that's a Catholic Christian, that's a Protestant Christian, that's a Baptist, that's an atheist, that's an agnostic, that's a Jew, that's a Muslim, that's a pagan, that's a Hindu, that's a Buddhist, that's an agnostic. They're all Americans, just with different religions. We didn't get there to that toleration without lots of blood. Remember that a culture is a group of people bound together by certain core beliefs. And to have aliens in your midst that don't believe in your God the way you do is dissonant, discordant. It's a problem. What to do? Well, the Jews know that it's a problem. They, and their insistence on remaining Jewish, cause a lot of the problem. The natives simply expect them, over time, to become like them, and the Jews can't. If the Jews compromise too much on the side of assimilating to native ways, they lose their identity. They stop eating kosher. They stop going to temple. They stop having their Sabbath from Sunset Friday to Sunset Saturday, and instead join everyone else on Sunday, or on Friday if they're in Islamic lands. They stop being Jews. And the whole identity of being a Jew is the covenant. God teaches and leads, we learn and we obey. And Jews believe that God has taught them to be Jewish. And there are good reasons to think this. But their refusal, which was a necessary refusal, creates static, creates tension, and ultimately leads to one of the most persistent forms of hate in human history. This is a vocab word anti-Semitism, which is an irrational hatred of the Jews. According to the story of uh, Noah, I think it's Noah, maybe it's earlier than that, Jews are descendants of Shem. 
they are Shemites or Semites. There are others who are descendants of Ham, and there are others who are descendants of other sons of Israel, other sons of Noah, other sons of Adam. I am honestly not sure where that separation happened. I don't recall right now. But it's early. It's either right after the flood or right after Cain and Abel that the people separate out. Anti-Semitism is an irrational hatred of the Jews. That's the definition I expect you to know. An irrational hatred of the Jews. It's one thing to be mildly irritated with people around you who live in a different fashion. It may not be politically correct to say, but I'm from New York. We had different cultures on different streets, cheek by jowl with one another. It's normal. Where do you think jokes come from? In my time, we didn't shy away from racial humor. There were jokes about blacks, about Puerto Ricans, about Jews, about Italians, about whites, or white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. They were called wasps. There were jokes about every group. Poles, Russians. You didn't get along with people by mealy-mouthing and trying to make believe that there's no tension. Of course there's tension. And the way human beings relieve tension in reality is by joking about it. You can get upset and angry and start assaulting people, or you can make jokes about them. Today, oh God, we're so much better than that. We're so pure, and therefore nobody speaks anything and comedy is dying. Nobody's truthful, nobody's honest, nobody's natural. It's natural to be discordant when you have different beliefs. You don't have to kill people. You don't have to hate people. In fact, making jokes about one another is a way to get along with people. In any event, the Jews had this problem. They could not fully assimilate, nor could they go home, because there was no home. Their home had been taken from them. So they became the wandering Jews, the wanderers of the earth, strangers in a strange land, whose very existence provoked anti-Semitism. So, in the, Middle East, in the Middle Ages, in European cities, at varying times, in varying places, and in varying ways, you may not live as one of us became the way things worked. You can live in our city, but you have to wear a special type of yellow, always. Women, scarves. Men, maybe a tie-like scarf, maybe a cockade, which is sort of a, a flowery bit of cloth, maybe a star sewn into your garments. You may not live as one of us, so that we can easily identify who is a Jew and who is not. You otherwise may be a person, a German, a Frenchman, an Englishman, an Italian, a Spaniard, a Portuguese, a Pole, a Russian. Be walking down the street and you see a member of the opposite sex and go, wow! Oh, wouldn't it be cool to date them? Wouldn't it be nice to try if I had the guts? Oh, God, if I had... Oh, wait. They're a Jew. It saves so much time to be able to identify from halfway down the block whether somebody is a person or a Jew. It is so much more convenient to know when you walk into somebody's store that they're a Jew or not. So... Jews were forced to wear garb, again, usually yellow, that indicated that they were not of us, that they were a people apart, that they were different, so that you could just spot. If you ever are assigned jury duty, which is a civic duty that you should do, and... You don't want to do it. 
One way of getting out of it is to say, I'd be a great juror. You know why? Because I can spot guilty people just like that. Because no one can do that unless they are psionically telepathic and can read minds or empathic and can read emotions, or if they're psychometrists and they can touch a bottle and that bottle was used in a crime 13 years ago. Without those psychic powers, anyone who claims to be able to spot guilty people just like that is a nutter, a crazy person, and you don't want them making decisions about who lives, who dies, who goes to jail, and who goes free. So, you can spot a Jew if they're orthodox, because the men wear yarmulkes, which is a small skull cap. And in the case of the Hasidim, the truly, uh, a group of truly orthodox Jews, sort of fu fundamentalist Jews, following the rules, they never cut their forelock. Men never cut their forelock. And their forelock is this part of hair that's in front of the ear. So what happens is these forelocks end up getting longer and longer as time goes on. They're usually curly. And so you can spot a Jew, a Jewish man, by the yarmulke, by the forelock. In certain times and certain places, Jews also wear a particular prayer shawl. Looks like a white woolen or linen or cotton vest with a lot of knots on it, complicated knot work. Often male Jews don't shave, so they have big beards and mustaches. They may get them barbered, but they don't shave. So sometimes Jews identify themselves. If you go to New York City today, to Brooklyn, to Jackson Heights, you will see a community of Jews that's existed as a coherent neighborhood, almost a self-created ghetto for 130, 140, almost 150 years. And the Jewish men wear black trousers. They look like the Amish almost. Black trousers, white shirts, the prayer shawl, black jackets, and these almost Amish-style black hats. They have the forelocks and the beards, and many of them are diamond merchants or jewelers. That tends to be the trade that's inherited within that self-created ghetto. So sometimes Jews will identify themselves, and women have similar hair. Again, they look a bit like the Amish, but they are Hasidim. They are Hasidic Jews, they are a variant of Jewish fundamentalist, and they self-identify. But those Jews that don't, they got to wear the yellow. They've got to wear the scarf or the star or something like that. Because you may not live as one of us. You've chosen not to be one of us beyond a certain point. Now we know it. So that's the first step of anti-Semitism. Instead of seeing them as real people, you see them as the Jews. A people apart. This very easily, once you create an out-group, anti -vaxxers. Not that that would ever happen today. There are people publicly talking about denying people who refuse to get the vaccination, hospital care, airline flights, their jobs. And there are a bunch of people saying, oh, yeah, we got to force those anti-vaxxers to get the vaccine. I took the vaccine. I have no problem with people who take the vaccine. But a government that can force you to take a drug against your will is a government that can force you to do anything. It's not a government that is Republican. It's a government that is tyrannical. The thought of stripping a citizen of this country of their rights to make a living, to travel, to speak, because those points of view are suppressed on the various social media platforms. The thought of denying people who are citizens who disagree with you, health care. Some have argued, oh, can't serve in the military. Oh, can't get public assistance. Where does it stop?
So the Jews, <coughs> being others than us, being outsiders, it's very easy to go from the first to the second stage. You may not live among us. So in the Middle Ages, Again, at different times and different places, there were anti-Jewish laws that forbade Jews from living in certain areas or performing certain jobs. Jewish doctors could handle other Jews, but whether they would be allowed to touch Gentiles, especially women or children, we don't know about that. It depends on the time and place. Special laws for Jews and for no one else. This was common. And the, the laws that required people to wear the yellow, that's an anti-Jewish law. There were many others. Ultimately, when the anti-Semitism became a part of the very fabric of society, like breathing in the air, you just know the Jews are dirty, the Jews are cheats, the Jews are liars. The Jews make their Passover matzo. They're unleavened bread. This is the worst. This is called the blood libel. Libel is a word that means an intentional fal falsehood. The story goes that Jews make unleavened bread as part of their Passover preparations. Unleavened bread is more like a cracker than bread. Leaven, yeast, turns bread fluffy and puffy and soft. But there's a secret ingredient in matzo, in unleavened bread, according to the bloodline. One of the horrible truths in life is that children disappear and are never found alive again. This has always been the case. And it is a horror show. There are few things that I can imagine that would be worse, worse than my child disappearing and me not knowing what happened to them. When I was five or six, I had twin sisters who were roommates. They weren't identical. They were fraternal. They were about three years younger than me. So they were two or three. They were probably three, so I was probably six. And back in the day, we used to play on the sidewalk, in the front yard, and on the street. So I wasn't around. My mom tells this story. The girls are playing in the front yard, right near the street. And this car stops in front of our house. And the guy driving opens the doors and says, I've got puppies. Do you want to see puppies? What little child wouldn't? They were approaching the car when my mom just happened to look out the window and see this. This is before she became a police officer. It's one of the reasons why she became a police officer. She came out the front door shouting, Get away from that car! And we were not raised with soft discipline. The hands of justice were a part of my growing up and my sister's growing up. So they listened. They heard that tone. They knew what that tone meant. They ran away from the car. The car sped off with the door bouncing closed. Had she been a minute later, they would have been in the car. And that sexual predator, that child molester, that kidnapper would have had my sisters. They may have been killed often happens. But even if they hadn't been killed, they would never have been the same. Sometimes it's not a predator. Sometimes it's a well. Timmy falls down a well. That's a joke about 1950s and 60s family television, a show called Lassie. Every week, one of the kids gets stuck somewhere, and the dog comes back and barks, and the family says, what is it, Lassie? Timmy stuck down a well, show us where. And the, the dog, the collie, beautiful collie, um, would lead the adults to where the kid is trapped and the adults would free the kid. Well, sometimes that really happens. 
Sometimes the kid gets lost. Sometimes the kid falls into a river. Sometimes the kid gets attacked by an animal. It's a horror show, but it happens. It's a fact of life. Sometimes children disappear. But what the blood libel says is that the Jews make matzo with the blood of a Gentile child. So, if a Gentile child, a non-Jewish child, disappears in their rage at the situation, the family and the community might go after any Jew nearby within arm's reach to search for their child and to make them pay because Jews are all child murderers. That's the blood libel. It is a falsehood. It has nothing to do with reality. Jews have never done that. It's a lie. But it's the sort of lie that people who don't have any other answers might gravitate to. <coughs> so Jews in areas where the anti-Semitism rises to a certain point are moved to a special neighborhood within the city. In the Middle Ages, cities have gates, they have walls. So here are the city walls, and at each point there'd be towers, and maybe there'd be another gate down here. Now, if the wind, prevailing wind, flows from west to east, then on the eastern side of town, you're going to have the stinky businesses, dye works, the leather tanneries, that sort of thing. That's not going to be walled off. It's just a place where stinky work gets done. Maybe you'll have stables around there, too. It's just because the wind is like this, the wealthy people want to be upwind of all that yuck. And in that part of town, they will wall off a neighborhood. And within that neighborhood, Jews will be allowed to live. That's the ghetto. A ghetto is not a slum like is used in American parlance. There were several times, constantly when I was a kid, I talked to people who said, I am from the ghetto. They were black or they were Puerto Rican and they lived in an ethnic slum. I get the connection, but it's not a real ghetto. Real ghettos have walls around. Ghettos are built in the Middle Ages to keep the Jews in. So these walls are not about keeping the non-Jews out. They're about keeping the Jews in after dark. So at sunset, there's a curfew. And if you are a Jew, you best be inside the ghetto unless you have a pass signed by somebody in power in the government. If you have a pass, then when the tough guys come to beat the little stop snot out of you, you can show them the pass and maybe they'll honor it. <laughs> if you have a Christian friend, it helps. Otherwise, you're in the ghetto, the walled-off Jewish neighborhood. Now, a few years ago, there were a couple of video games that dealt with this. The Witcher series of video games, 1, 2, and 3, and the Dragon Age games, Dragon Age Origins, um, forget the second, the Dragon Age 2, Dragon Age Inquisition, both of these games, and Dragon Age was based on The Witcher. It was basically a cheap ripoff. Both of these games have walled-off neighborhoods in their cities called alienages. And in the alienage, the elves and the dwarves who lived with humans, rather than out in the, in the wilds in the forest and mountains, lived in this slum that was walled off from decent folk. And that's where you can get certain jobs done. Dwarves make good weapons, elves make good potions, and so forth. But they were slums. They were run-down areas in the stinky part of town, walled off. And if an elf or a dwarf were caught after curfew outside, they would be punished by the crowd 
or by the government. This is clearly based on what happened to the Jews in many places at many times in the Middle Ages. You may not live among us. Now, getting into the 20th century, you have the Nuremberg Laws. In 1933, Adolf Hitler becomes Chancellor of Germany. He becomes the leader of Germany and a few weeks later, there is a fire at their Congress called the Reichstag. And that fire was caused by arson. And they blamed a Jew. That could be a communist, I think. So the newspaper said, this is insurrection. Something's got to be done. And the government suspended liberties and gave Hitler emergency power. Some of the language used after the January 6th riot is similar to the language used in the German press after the burning of their Congress building. And there have been people, thank goodness, in my opinion, people who were not listened to who wanted to restrict civil liberties lest another buffalo hatted guy wearing flag tattoo makeup might come and scare the poor congressman. In the case of Hitler's Germany, civil rights were suspended. They were never, never reestablished, not until the defeat of Germany in World War II. And Hitler's emergency powers were used until the day he swallowed his own Walther pistol who his brains out. So, a couple of years into his reign, in 1935, Hitler's Justice Department, that's what they call their Attorney General's office, Hitler's Justice Department establishes what are called the Nuremberg Laws on Race. The Nuremberg Laws of 1935 strip Jews of their citizenship, making them subjects. They're allowed to live in Germany, time being, but they don't have the rights of Germans. They're not citizens, they're subjects. They're not enfranchised, they're residents. So, what to do? Well, Jews are not allowed to serve in the government. All Jewish elected officials are stripped of their office. Jews are not allowed to serve in the military. All Jewish officers and soldiers are cashiered. Jews are not allowed to serve as teachers, for they may corrupt the youth. Jews are not allowed to be lawyers or practice law. And so on and so on, and so on. A maximum amount of wealth was allowed to be possessed by Jews. Everything above that had to be immediately sold. Now, that is a blatant money grab. Hitler himself was not a thief. You can accuse him of being many things, but he didn't steal. Other people stole for him, but he didn't steal. But most of the other Nazis, leaders especially, would realize that Hyman, or Saul, or Moshe has more than they are allowed to have. And they will let everyone know that they'll expect to be able to buy their house. The Nazis will be able, expecting to buy the house of the Jew that can no longer afford it because it's worth too much money. Now, other Germans that might want to give a fair price are going to be intimidated by the Nazi leadership into backing away. So a Jew that has a, I'm just picking a number out of the air, a $300,000 house, 
and that's more than a Jew is allowed to own in any kind of resource, is going to have to sell it. Carl over there might be willing to buy the house at fair market value, maybe three hundred and ten, three hundred and fifteen thousand dollars Deutschmark, you can say, or Reichmarks in those days. But Gert, Gerd, is a Nazi leader, and Gerd offers the Jew twenty five thousand dollars, and Gerd lets it be known that he is bidding on that house. Carl does not want his door caved in by SS boots in the middle of the night. Carl does not want his family terrorized by the bully boys of the Nazi party. Carl does not want to get sued or go to a concentration camp as a dissident. Carl doesn't want trouble. So Carl withdraws his offer of 315,000 Reichmarks. And Gerd comes in and takes the property at 25 grand because no one else is going to bid on it. So now the Jew is out of his property and is out on the street until he finds a place to live, usually some hovel somewhere. And Gerd now has a $300,000 Gerd now has a 300,000 Reichmark house that he paid 25,000 uh, Reichmarks for. Pretty good for Gerd. This happens throughout Germany, and every year the Nuremberg Laws shrink the amount of assets Jews are allowed to own. So every year there is profiteering to be done. Ultimately, Jewish doctors are not allowed to treat Gentile patients. Ultimately, if a Jewish man is alone in a room and in a, in a room, is alone in a room with a non-Jewish woman, and somebody accuses him of rape, he has to demonstrate his innocence. The burden of proof is on him. Do you know how hard it is to prove that you didn't commit a crime? And if he's found guilty, he might be sterilized by the government. His ability to procreate, destroyed by a government order, by doctors. He might go to, go to a concentration camp, or he might be killed outright, either, either by Nazi street thugs or by the justice system. Marriages between Jews and non-Jews are annulled. Now, all of this depends upon a certain way, a certain method, a method to, with certainty, identify who is Jewish. And at first, the Nazi jurists who were trying to, to write these laws could not fathom how to do it. See, Judaism is not merely a religious religion. It's an ethnicity. In Europe, to be a Jew means you come from Jewish parents and grandparents all the way back. Whether or not you go to a temple, whether or not you keep kosher, whether or not you celebrate Passover, or Yom Kippur, or Sukkoth, or any of the other high holy days in the Jewish calendar. At what point is someone Jewish? Because there are so many mixed marriages that happened over the years. Is somebody who's partially Jewish, Jewish or not? But the Nazis had an example. In the American South, after the Civil War, the U.S. government with the United States Army enforced what was called Reconstruction, the rebuilding of Southern society in a non-racist format. There were blacks who were elected to Congress at this time. There were blacks who were elected to mayorships at this time, to state legislatures at this time, by areas of these former Confederate states that had majority black population. But the U.S. Army was not going to stay in Alabama or Mississippi forever. As the American military left, 
and home rule was returned to the southern states in the early 1870s, on average. Those states enacted laws that today are called Jim Crow laws. Those Jim Crow laws restrict the legal rights of blacks. Now, the U.S. Constitution say, says that blacks are free and that blacks are United States citizens if they are born here. So black people are citizens. They're not slaves. They can vote. And they have voted during the time of Reconstruction. But less than 10 years after the Civil War, the local states are now under home rule control. They are under the control of the Democrat Party, just like they were before the war. And Southern Democrats do not want to share power with blacks. So these Jim Crow laws create a series of obstacles that discourage black people from voting, ever. They also, many of them, support the secret empire of the Ku Klux Klan, a society of war veterans founded by the Confederate cavalry general Nathan Bedford Forrest. The Klan typically rides around the countryside wearing white robes and white masks, like sheets, pillowcases, with holes in them. The Klan is not an aspect of the government. The Klan is an outlaw body. But with the support of many in the political leadership of these states, the Klan is allowed to lynch blacks, burn crosses on their yards, beat them sometimes to death, hang them to death, torture their families, destroy their property. And the police and the courts won't do a blessed thing. How did the Jim Crow laws describe somebody who is black? Well, if you have a black grandparent, then you are qualified as partially black, therefore as black. So the Germans, as they wrote the Nuremberg Laws, defined Jewry as anyone with at least one Jewish great-grandparent, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a partial Jew, and anyone with a Jewish grandparent as a full Jew. And so people are defined by how they're born. Their legal rights or lack thereof all by their birth. Now I don't know about you, but I don't remember the time in heaven before I was born where I chose my parents, my skin color, my nation, the religion I'd be born into. Maybe you do. For most of us today, the thought of pigeonholing somebody because of how they're born is outrageous, disgusting, and evil. The Nuremberg Laws take inspiration from our Jim Crow Laws, which were abolished in the 1960s, in defining who is Jewish and therefore who will be an unperson. This all sets the stage for the last and most terrible phase of anti-Semitism, which we shall discuss next week. Now, before we go, essays on terrorism is something I had deferred. In your note packet, may I borrow somebody's please? May I borrow your note packet, please? If you go ahead of the notes to the next page after the notes on the 9-11 stuff stop. You will see a page with a series of if-then statements. If the enemy in the war on terror is such and such. I want you to look at these 
and write a half-page essay, half-page side, handwritten. Who you think the enemy in the war on terror is, and how we should fight them. You can use these exemplars, or you can come up with your own answer. This is not going to be due Monday. This is going to be due the day after the Obsession movie is shown. The Obsession movie I expect to show middle to late next week to conclude all of this. So, get started on your terrorism essay. Look at this page. Decide which of these answers you believe, or if you believe something else. And it will be due the day after the Obsession movie. Thank you. Have a good day. Same question there. Who's the enemy in the war on terror? How should it be fought?